So hello everybody. I'm going to give you a uh, overview of uh, network and pathway analysis um, leading up to a practical that uh, my associate uh, Robin Haw, known to you all, um, will uh, will lead you through after the after the lecture. Okay, so I think you may have heard a, um, a lot of this from Yuri yesterday. Um, so just shuffle your feet or wave at me or something if I'm uh, going over well-trod uh, topology. Uh, but the, the main reason people are interested in doing pathway analysis in cancers uh, is because of the dramatic size reduction of the data, of the data set. Um, cancer is notorious for having a long tail of rare cancer mutations. These are mutations which occur um, uh, relatively rarely. One or a, one or a couple of uh, uh, of cancer uh, cancers per hundred donors. Um, they are um, they don't pass statistical tests for recurrence, so you can't document that they're drivers. Yet they have a functional impact. They may affect genes that you think might be important. But you can't you can't document them, and the idea of pathway analysis is that um, even if um, the uh, a mutation in a particular gene doesn't occur frequently enough to have statistical power to document its driverness, um, however, uh, the pathway, the the molecular mechanism, molecular process that the that gene participates in. Uh, may be a driver pathway, and by aggregating genes into a set of genes that are rarely mutated into a set of pathways that are more commonly mutated, you achieve the statistical power to um, uh, uh, to make a uh, make a, uh, a statement of statistical significance, and it also um, at the same time allows you to tell a coherent biological story about why these genes are contributing to the cancer phenotype. So I'm going to talk about pathway and network analysis kind of interchangeably. They really are two aspects of the same thing, and it depends on whether you're coming from the task from a more biological, um, biochemical um, uh, orientation, or whether you're coming from the more computer science um, uh, network mathematical model orientation. So in general, this type of analysis is any analytic technique that makes use of biological pathway or, molec or molecular network information to gain insights into uh, a cancer or other uh, disease or biological system. Very rapidly evolving field. There are um, literally thousands of papers published on different network techniques every year, many different, many different approaches. Uh, I want to start by um, Distinguishing between the pathway and the network network views, um, the uh, I'm showing here uh, a, a simple, very simplified version of the same biological pathway, the uh, EGFR uh, receptor and its immediate uh, downstream uh, effects, and you can look at the same pathway in two different ways. You can use a traditional pathway-oriented view. By the way, do I have a do I have a laser pointer? Oh yeah, I'll just use the mouse appears. Okay, great. So here is the um, uh, the the Boringer Mannheim biochemical Leninger bio Leninger view of the uh, of EGF. Um, uh, the EGF ligand binds to the EGF receptor. There is a negative regulator here, um, uh, uh, LRIG one. It causes a, it creates a, uh, a, a conjugate between EGF and EGFR that leads to a dimerization reaction. There's a hydrolysis of ATP, uh, leading to a phosphorylated phosphorylated form that then leads to later events, which aren't shown here. And there's an, another inhibitor at this step, SRC1. Uh, so this is a traditional way of looking at it, but it's it's actually is mathematically somewhat difficult to deal with because you have many different types of interactions. 
you have a binding interaction, you have a dimerization, you have a, you have a, a hydrolysis, you have topological effects here, and modeling each of these is quite, is quite difficult. Uh, uh, so what computer scientists prefer to do is to turn it into a network where they don't care about the precise nature of the uh, uh, nature of the events that occur or their precise order, but they do uh, care about the directionality. And what we're showing here is now EGF is shown as activating EGFR receptor um, that is then uh, activating, uh, this is probably a mistake actually, a, a HCC1, there's an, yeah, okay, that's a mistake, LRG1 is inhibiting EG, EGF, and SHC1 here should be shown as, e, as inhibiting EGFR. Interestingly, I've shown this a zillion times and only noticed the mistake this time, right? Uh, what you can also do with a, uh, a network is you can add in uh, nodes and interactions which are not that well characterized. So, for example, if you have a, uh, a proteomics experiment that shows that these additional genes, such as KRT17, SOS1, are interacting with these various proteins, uh, or you have a suppressor enhanced, genetic suppressor enhancer screen that can show that it's a genetic interaction, you can layer them onto the network and make some inferences about them, even if you don't know precisely what they're doing. How they're how they're interacting at the molecular level. Okay, and the other thing the other thing you should know is that you can convert between the pathway uh, oriented version and the network oriented version uh, in a straightforward fashion. Unfortunately, you can't go back the other way. There's information loss. So in all network pathway analysis, you start with two main ingredients. First, um, which should be familiar to you from yesterday, uh, the first ingredient is a list of the uh, altered genes, proteins, RNAs, whatever it is you're studying in your biological system. Typical experiment is a cell line treated with a drug versus not treated with a drug. Do a RNA seq or micro or, 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 uh, or expression array, and you identify uh, up and down regulated genes. Second is you need a source of pathways or networks to do the analysis on. Pretty simple. So let's talk about what these ingredients are. So you've all, the previous five days you've talked about generating genes, proteins, RNAs, and so on. We won't go through that. But where do you get pathways and networks? Well, they come from two sources. The main source is pathway databases. These are um, Cura uh, curated, usually very labor-intensive uh, databases, uh, which capture uh, biological processes in a biochemical biochemical style. They capture cause and effect very well, exact biological interactions. Sometimes they're detailed down to the particular amino acids which are altered within a protein uh, uh, by a ubiquinylation or phosphorylation step. Um, and uh, they're very amenable to human interpretable visualizations. So you can look at the path, you can draw a picture of the pathway, you can show where the alterations are, and usually, um, because we're trained to do this, uh, it makes sense to us. Disadvantages of the pathway databases is their coverage of the genome is sparse. Because we don't know everything there is to know about uh, bi biological pathways, we're only able to say, uh, something intelligent about maybe three quarters of the genes in the, in the genome. Uh, and extracting that information from literature and high throughput experiments is manually intensive, so pathway databases tend to be incomplete. Also because it is, because pathways are uh, to many, to much extent subjective. They are, they depend on what part of the thread of the big tangled ball of yarn a particular researcher started pulling on. Um, different databases and different curators disagree on the boundaries of pathways. So for example, all the signaling pathways, EGFR, PIC3C, um, TGF, beta, they all have in many interactions within, within the cell. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, to me also, pathways are like, cell dependent, like the pathway in uh, stomach cells would be different yeah. from. So when they, they build these databases, What's a reference? Do they just kind of 
Like, how do they say this pathway is specific to X cell type? Yeah, very good, very good point. Uh, the, yeah, the question is, oh, yeah, right, we're on tape. The question is, um, how do uh, pathway databases deal with the fact that uh, different pathways are active in different cells? And in fact, the same uh, pathways uh, can be routinely rewired and reused in various ways. Um, to various extents, um, they all the pathway databases are aware of the problem, and they attempt to um, they uh, attempt to deal with the problem as well as possible usually by presenting uh, consensus pathways, um, which are, um, uh, you know, uh, which are kind of a unification of all the possible pathways that might be going on in any cell type. And, and then when there's a strong cell-specific dependency, they show a cell-specific cell -specific pathway. So um, in the reactome database, for, for example, um, we uh, you know, we know that the that you know the liver is very different from the muscle, and so when there are overlapping pathways between the two, we just uh, that use different isoforms of uh, enzymes. We specifically annotate what cell type it occur, occurs in, and the um, uh, the idea of a consensus pathway is that you can take the expression pattern from a particular cell type and filter the pathway and remove, remove genes that are not actually being produced in that, um, in that cell type and thereby um, pr prune the pathway. Okay. But that's, that's another of the problems. So it's also a problem with network, network analysis. Okay. So here's a typical pathway diagram. This is from uh, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, KEG, uh, and this is actually this is actually a, a, a fascinating union pathway because it includes both eukaryotic and prokaryotic genes. Um, that's a, another detail: is that some pathway databases are species do species-specific annotation, and others attempt to capture all of possible biology and put it in one place. Uh, KIG does this by reducing genes to uh, uh, proteins and RNAs to enzymatic activities. So it's very focused on, bio on uh, intermediary metabolism. Reactome, um, which uh, is the project that Robin and I uh, work on, uh, along with uh, 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 researchers at uh, NYU under Peter Distachio and uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute under Henning Hermjacob. Um, is explicitly uh, human-centric. It focuses on curation of just a, um, a documented uh, human, uh, human pathways uh, and has a focus on disease-related uh, disease pathways. So we do a, a lot on cancer, a lot on signaling pathways in cancer, a lot of uh, regulation of, uh, of cell growth um, and uh, migration. So uh, I'll talk about, oh, wow, this is out of date. So reactome is hand curated. It have, follows rigorous curation standards. Every reaction is traceable to the primary literature. When there's been a piece of, uh, when there's been a, a experiment that was performed on a model system, such as a mouse, we, added, we curated it in mouse, and then we explicitly um, project it onto, onto human proteins and provide an, uh, reasons we, why we think that it's going on in the human. Um, it covers, actually, this, is, this, is, this slide was put together several years ago. We're now at uh, over 10,000 uh, human, human genes. Robin, what's the, current tenth, what's the current number in the last release? 10,200, something like that? Okay. Over 10,000 and uh, over 1,500 human pathways. It, it features a, a, a very nice, uh, scrollable, zoomable uh, reaction diagram that actually adapts to the, um, uh, to the level of zoom to show more, more detail as you get closer. 
Uh, it allows you to find, it has some online analytics, including finding pathways contained in your gene list and calculating the gene overrepresentation of the pathways. And it allows you to project human pathways onto other species. And the, the nicest feature about it is it's completely open access. It's actually the largest open access um, pathway database uh, currently, currently in existence. So that's pathways. Now, where do networks come, come from? Well, networks uh, are much broader and they will cover less well understood relationships. So you can build anything that relates to, mo to entities in the, uh, in the genome, whether it's proteins or genes or RNAs or lipids, um, and any type of interaction, genetic ones, physical ones, co-expression, more abstract things like sharing gene ontology terms or being close to each other in pathways, you can build a network out of them. And these networks, by and large, are useful. So network databases can be built automatically or via curation. They typically have more extensive coverage of, of biology. Uh, but the trade-off is that the relationships and the underlying evidence are more tentative and more noisy. And so here are a few sources of curated networks. You can just sort of see the order of magnitude of the numbers. BioGrid, at the time I made this slide a couple years ago, had um, over 500,000 genes and 167,000 interactions across multiple species. Uh, and um, uh, Intact had 60,000, 203,000 interactions. Mint had, Mint had fewer. Depends on the size of their staff and their standards for curation. Uh, there are, uh, uh, s there are uh, several hundred pathway and network databases. It's very hard to keep track of them. A resource that I recommend is called Pathway Commons. So it's maintained at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it contains a, um, uh, it is a, um, it has two features. One is it has a big index of all the pathway and network databases. Um, kept relatively up to date. And second, for the major pathways and network databases, um, there's a file interchange a pathway uh, interchange system called Biopax, in which these all these source databases upload their, their pathways into, in, into the commons for people to uh, search and compare. So they're a union, union of databases. OK. So, Typically, you won't be interacting directly with these pathway or network databases, except maybe to do visualization. You'll mostly be do using uh, people's software tools, such as uh, Yuri's, uh, Yuri's uh, uh, G Profiler or the Broad Institute's GSEA. And they draw on these pathway databases, create their own data sets that are used as the substrate for the analysis. So let's talk about the types of analysis you can do. There are basically uh, three different three different ways that you can uh, uh, you can analyze pathways and networks. The simplest one, and that's the one that um, uh, you, you learned about yesterday, is uh, enrichment of uh, of gene sets. And here um, uh, you have a uh, set of uh, you have a set of buckets. So uh, buckets based on shared pathways or shared gene ontology terms uh, or shared participation in gene processes. And you look for statistical overrepresentation of the genes in your gene list in one or more of these, um, uh, one or more of these uh, uh, buckets to identify networks which are enriched in the gene, enriched or depleted in your gene list. Okay, that's the first type. The second type is where you don't have a preconceived notion of uh, what the pathways and networks are or what the buckets are. Instead, you let your data um, discover those networks. So you take, for, typically you take a big network of all the possible interactions that people know about or all the possible pathways people know about um, and filter them through your gene list to identify subnetworks in which your genes are participating more frequently than you would expect by chance. So that brings up, that can bring up and allow you to discover de novo, um, uh, de novo networks or de novo clusters. 
and there are quite a few popular uh, popular pieces of uh, analytic algorithms in this class. And the final one is uh, pathway-based modeling, where um, um, uh, where you have built a uh, uh, a causal model of some pathway of interest, such as PIC3CA signaling. And then you put your, uh, your data set, genes that are mutated in your cancer, on top of this model of the pathway to see what its integrated effects are. And this would allow you, for example, to test out hypotheses for synthetic lethals, what happens to the pathway when two different genes are uh, inactivated simultaneously. Each of these three uh, types of analysis has different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, for the type 1, it is a gr uh, great way of finding out quickly what biological processes are altered in um, this cancer or the system, that you're, the system that you're looking at. So it'll give you a quick read that, well, I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, regulation of the immune system or I'm looking at changes in, uh, in cell mobility, or I'm looking at something affecting the cell cycle. The second one allows you to find new pathways altered in the cancer, and also allows you to find clinically relevant tumor subtypes. So for example, this subtype of medulloblastoma uh, affects the hedgehog pathway, and this one affects um, a pathway that seems to be a, a combination of, of wind, sig wind signaling um, and um, ARID1A. And the final one uh, uh, for pathway-based model modeling uh, allows you to dig into those pathways in detail to predict how the path predict and later test how the pathway activities are altered in a particular uh, patient who may have a distinct cluster of mutations uh, and identify targetable pathways in, in the patient and do in silico uh, uh, drugs, drug screening style experiments. Okay, so we're going to go through them quickly. The um, enrichment of fixed gene sets I think you've already seen pretty well. The advantage of them is that they're very easy to perform, they're good end user tools, and the statistical models have been well worked out. And these are stable pieces. These are stable pieces of software that will give you results. Uh, disadvantages are um, first, you have to pick your gene sets because there are many, many different dimensions of gene sets to look at, and you'll get different answers depending on which gene sets you check. The gene sets are very heavily overlapping, uh, and so uh, typically you will get uh, many similar sounding, uh, many similar sounding uh, um, pathways or processes, and you have to go through a second step of aggregating them together using enrichment maps, which I you talked about yesterday, right? You do enrichment maps? Okay. Well, uh, that's a technique which I'm not going to cover for taking um, uh, bio, uh, taking uh, pathway hits and grouping them together. Uh, according to shared, shared genes and, and simplifying the results. And finally, because most of the fixed gene set uh, anal analytic tools treat the, um, uh, treat the gene sets as just bags of genes without any relationship among them, uh, y you're left to sort out um, why um, the relationships among, um, among the genes inside those bags. So de novo subnetwork construction and clustering, which we, we will talk about, um, is uh, you take a biological network and apply a list of altered biological entities, genes, proteins, and RNAs to that network to identify uh, topologically unlikely configurations among your list of altered, uh, alters, whatevers. That is, you're looking for uh, a subset <laughs> Of the genes or proteins in your uh, in in your test test data, which are closer to each other in the network than you would expect by chance. That is, they're they're talking to each other in some way. They're not randomly distributed across the whole network. You can then extract clusters from these unlikely configurations and then annotate them by adding biological meaning to them. So here's an example of doing this uh, in uh, in in Reactome. 
is using a tool called the Re Reactome FIVIS, which is a Cytoscape plugin. Um, so uh, you start out with a uh, a network of um, uh, a, a network of uh, genes or proteins. In this case, it's using uh, a a reactome generated network called the reactome functional interaction network. It's actually a union between curated pathways that have been converted into networks and uncurated interaction evidence from a variety of sources. Then apply your gene list to uh, this big hairball and you extract a smaller set of interacting clusters, each of which contains a statistically unlikely number of the genes which are altered in your gene set. So you cluster, you cluster them using the same, it actually uses the same algorithms that are used to analyze social networks such as Facebook. And uh, then you, uh, then uh, the tool allows you to uh, annotate each of these clusters. So here is, for example, is a big cluster of cell cycle checkpoints. Here's a trail signaling area. Here's a row GTPA signaling area. Here's Oh, here's DNA repair P53. And so just by looking at this, you can tell that it's a, it's a cancer. In fact, this is a breast, ca this is a breast cancer cluster. Here's a little uh, a closer look at the Reactome FI network. We're seeing 5% of it. It's a fairly accurate one. It has few false positives by a variety of measures. And here's uh, how it can be applied to um, a, a human cancer. So this is a typical cancer. These are whole genome sequencing of uh, 50 pancreatic cancer. There are more than 200 recurrently mutated genes among them. Uh, here's K, uh, the number one is KRAS with uh, almost 95% uh, of the, the tumors are uh, covered, followed by P53, followed by SMAD4, and then here's the long, long, long tail that stretches way out. Uh, of genes which are mutated two or more times in that data set. You can only show statistical significance for the first few, four of these in this small data set. So um, after extracting uh, from the network and clustering them, you actually get a much small, much cleaner set of, uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> pathway clusters. Um, there are roughly 10 of them here. and they typically make sense. We know that axon guidance is one of the driver pathways in pancreatic cancer, and in fact, axon guidance comes out, out here in a cluster that also includes uh, EGFR and ERB, um, and ERB B. Here's P53. Here's another axon guidance uh, cluster, and here's Hedgehog. You can then use these. You can then make these clusters the unit of analysis. We can ask. Is the distribution among clusters different among different patients with pancreatic cancer? And in this case, um, that actually works works quite well. We've taken uh, we have the various modules here. Uh, we're scoring them according to whether a patient has a mutation in one or more of the genes within those modules. Here are those 50 patients, and they actually uh, cluster very nicely into a, uh, a, um, a large cluster of, of tumor types here, which have both module 1 and 2 frequently mutated, type 3, which is only module um, uh, 2, type 2, which is a combination of the three modules 1, 2, and 10, and then a rare type up here, which is negative here but is positive for module 7. So you can discover uh, tumor, tumor subtypes in this way. Uh, sometimes these subtypes will tell you about uh, uh, clinically relevant features. Uh, here is a case in which um, uh, we use the same technique in breast cancer, uh, actually an expression, uh, an expression ex series of expression experiments across multi uh, 200 breast cancers, uh, and found that one of the modules, one involving uh, Aurora B signaling and the uh, cell cycle M phase, uh, is an, really an excellent uh, predictor of uh, survival. These are all estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients. They have a good prognosis. However, patients with uh, uh, increased expression of any of the genes in this data set 
um, have a uh, have a very have a much worse prognosis. In fact, they're as bad as the their survival curve is as bad as the triple negative patients. So you could propose developing a biomarker based assay based on this that would identify uh, estrogen receptor positive patients who might have, a, might have a more aggressive form of the tumor and might need more conservative therapy. Okay, so here are some popular network clustering algorithms that you can use. So uh, gene, uh, a gene mania, which is developed here at the, uh, in Toronto, at the University of Toronto by uh, Gary Bader and Quaid Morris, follows a birds of a feather principle. It's a it has a beautiful inter web-based interface. You upload your gene set, and it finds genes which are um, uh, it, it finds clusters of genes which are uh, related to those, interact with those uh, in your in your list. And it's extremely it's extremely easy uh, to use, very powerful. Uh, um, a more uh, a somewhat more difficult. Um, uh, a uh, piece of software to use, it needs to be installed on your desktop, is Hotnet from Ben, Ruff, from ben Raphael in the, um, at Brown University. Uh, what, uh, what this does is it uses a more sophisticated algorithm that, um, uh, given a network, finds, um, uh, finds uh, 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 models the network as a metallic lattice. Um, in, you insert your uh, um, you uh, insert your gene list give with uh, with values. That is, uh, if you know a gene is activated, you put it in as a hot value. If you know it's inactivated, like a p53 um, uh, loss of function mutation, you put it in as a cold mod, cold cluster, and then it propagates the hot and cold genes across the network to find clusters which are predicted to be increased or decreased. And that will give you regions of the network. It will give you pathways that are predicted to be activated or inactivated. And its big advantage is that unusually well annotated genes like p53, which have thousands of literature references and have seem to interact with everything in the cell, those are actually down. Uh, the, there's a strong bias to, to pull those up as significance. This corrects to, to, for that to some extent. p53 will not come up. Unless it's uh, unless it actually is involved, then there are two uh, applications for Cytoscape. How many people know Cytoscape? Seen, you've all seen Cytoscape. Great. So the two nice apps that you can get on the Cytoscape um, uh, uh, the Cytoscape uh, store. One is Hypermodules, written by Yuri. Did he talk about it yesterday? Okay. Well, I recommend it. It's good. It. Um, uh, it is designed to find network clusters that correlate with clinical characteristics. So you put in lists of patients and the genes that are changed for patients who have some clinical characteristic that you care about, such as response to a drug versus not. And it will combine those two forms of data and attempt to find cluster network clusters that correlate with the clinical characteristic. And then there is the Reactome FI Network Cytoscape app called Reactome FI Viz. And it offers, it, it takes a whole bunch of the clustering and correlation algorithms out there, including Hotnet, um, Paradigm, and, and Paradigm, which I'll talk about later. Um, and it gives you a nice interactive way of converting pathways into networks, doing the clustering, annotating the clustering, and then correlating them with. Uh, clinical characteristics such as survival. Okay, the last type of analysis I'll talk about is computational pathway-based modeling. So here again, you apply a list of altered entities that you care about, genes, proteins, RNAs, to uh, biological pathways using models which preserve the causal nature of that, of that pathway. It preserves the detailed biological relationships and the order of events. What these attempt to do is to integrate uh, two or more molecular alterations together uh, to turn them into lists of altered pathways activities. And it is sort of an entry, it's a, a gateway drug into systems biology. So the types of pathway-based modeling, um, so this is where um, this is this is cutting edge of of um, uh, of 
network of network analysis, um, and it's here where there are, there are lots of uh, lots of pieces lots of pieces of software that are in development at various stages of maturity, um, and there's little consensus in the community about what works the best. So I'm just going to give you a, a little laundry list here. So there are the the oldest and most mature types of pathway-based modeling are partial differential equations and Boolean models, which uh, were developed, have been developed since the 1960s and are based on reaction kinetics. Michaelis, Menten, uh, uh, Equilibria, and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, KAs and KMs, things that we, have, we learned about in biochemistry a long time ago. Um, they're mostly suited for biochemical systems, such as metabolomics. Their primary use case is yeast in um, uh, uh, yeast in uh, fermenters, studying the flow of metabolites, uh, and they're good to mod. They can handle models up to about a dozen proteins and in, uh, interacting proteins, enzymes, and genes. Um, not usually not suitable usually for for cancer analysis. The, then there are network flow models, which were designed specifically for uh, kinase cascades. And the two that are most widely used are NetForest and NetworkKin. Uh, if you have a system in which you're studying perturbations of a uh, perturbations of a pathway that lead to a, uh, a lead to phosphorylation products, these are designed specifically. For hand for uh, modeling and making predictions from kinase cascades. Then there is a series of um, uh, network-based reconstruction methods designed specifically for expression arrays. Uh, one of the um, best of these is uh, Arachne, developed by uh, Andrea Califano's group at Columbia University a number of years ago, and designed to pull out transcriptional regulatory pathways uh, from, um, from expression arrays and from RNA-seq data uh, and um, to identify mass, what are called master regulators. So what the transcriptional regulatory factors that sit at the top of a transcriptional uh, pathway, it'll, it will identify them if any exist in your data set. And then there are uh, a, um, uh, there's, then there's software that uh, implements probabilistic graph models. Um, the most widely used of these is Paradigm. This is actually used at, uh, widely used for cancer analysis. And what, what PGMs do is to create a model of the positive and negative interactions in a biological pathway. So it explicitly converts a biological pathway into a network, preserving the uh, the directional directions of influence, and then from a data set, it can learn the weights uh, assigned to each of those interactions. And then once you've trained it to learn, to, uh, trained it with, in your system, you can use it to make predictions, such as putting a cancer genome on it and seeing um, which pathways have been uh, are altered and what direction they're altered. So here's an example of how Paradigm works. A very simple, simple one in which I have MDM2 inhibiting TP53, and then this is leading to uh, apoptosis. And apoptosis is the activity that I'm interested in in modeling. Okay. So there's actually many different ways. Uh, even in this simple two-step pathway, there are many different ways to change the pathway activity. You can have alterations at the gene level, the RNA level, the protein level, um, and other levels as well. In each of these cases, there are different ways of changing the gene or the RNA or protein. For example, you can knock the gene out with a, with a deletion. Uh, you can increase its activity by duplicating it. Um, you can change its activity by uh, a fusion that brings a promoter in. So all these various types of changes are modeled by paradigm. And the influence of the gene on the RNA on the protein is captured. Okay, so uh, each of these steps has a different weight. You apply a uh, data set to it, such as a large number of cancers, and it will um, uh, 
uh, it will learn those weights. Now, the best way to, to, to work with it is if you have a TCGA style data set where you've got both genome and RNA, and if you have a proteome, that's even better because then it can, learn, it can learn the model quite well and understand the relationships between the perturbations in each of these. If you just have, if you just have, um, uh, just have sequence, DNA sequence, it won't work very well. If you just have RNA, it will actually work pretty, it'll work pretty well. Uh, um, and if you, have, uh, if, if you have a choice, I would recommend a transcriptome plus, uh, um, uh, plus a copy number array or a low pass genome to at least capture amplifications and deletions and that'll give you two axes. Okay so oh yeah so here is various types of data that you can put into it mutations from sequencing, CNVs, mass spec proteomics, mRNA uh, assessments and when you've got all this data it actually works really really uh, uh, really really well. Here is the first publication, uh, a, a, a screenshot from a uh, figure from the first publication on Paradigm, which was in 2012. Um, and it shows a large GBM data set for which they had uh, all the data, including uh, proteomics. Um, and uh, a, um, they apply, they built models of, um, of um, uh, about 30 different major pathways. Uh, and then use Paradigm to, uh, to predict changes in uh, pathway activity. And they found uh, uh, four um, major subtypes of GBM, each of which was defined by differing alterations in uh, pathway activity. Uh, and unlike the example I showed you it, with, um, with clustering, um, it, it actually gives you the direction of the change. So with clustering, it says, well, this cluster of genes has changed somehow, but it doesn't tell you how it changed. So this is showing that in type 3 GBM, there is strong inhibition, downregulation, of the GATA uh, interleukin pathway. Uh, EGFR is increased in type 2 and 3, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of detail down here. So this not only gives you uh, clusters, but it also tells you how at the activity level one is differing from the other. Now the good and the bad news about Paradigm is that um, it's still, to this date, it's distributed in source code form. It's actually hard to get installed. You have to build your own pathway models. The documentation is scant and it takes weeks to run. Uh, the good news is that um, as of several years ago, we ported it into Reactome FIViz as a Cytoscape app. It's now very easy to install and run. We include access to Reactome-based pathway models, and we've improved performance, and it now takes um, uh, overnight to run rather than weeks. So um, that, yeah, that is the um, the rest of the lecture is, uh, you know, uh, references for you. They're in your printed notes. Mm -hmm.